I've always found myself to be supportive of anyone that I meet. And I never turn down any advice from anyone. Even if they were like... Yeah, I don't care what... Yeah, it doesn't matter. Because I can take that advice and I could throw it away. Or I could go, huh, I don't agree with this part, but this part's interesting. And I could take that and apply that for my own success. Mm -hmm. So, but if I just was like dismissed you, like, ah, you're a jerk. What the hell do you know? You're old, whatever. You know, you're a woman. What do you know? Things like that. Mm -hmm. You're missing an opportunity to in, not only maybe enrich your life in some ways, but also to help your business be more successful. You should always be open to what anybody has to say. It doesn't mean you have to do what they say, but you should always listen. That's what growth mindset is. Yeah. So the difference yeah. between fixed mindset and growth mindset is fixed people, they stay stagnant. Yeah. And growth mindset sees that Dude. opportunity to grow and Absolutely. build, Absolutely. progress. Five, four, Hello world, back at it again with another episode of Bindalism, a philosophy to a self-sufficient lifestyle, brought to you by the homies at Boho Hobo. In this episode, we get to meet the founder of Grove Gourmet, Mark Grove. Mark is a natural-born entrepreneur with a drive to make the most out of what life has to offer. Alongside his wife, Rochelle, it is with passion and hard work that they have been able to establish Grove Gourmet with the staple products that they have today. Grove Gourmet creates homemade cooking and dipping oils from original recipes out of scenic upstate New York. Whether it's in speaking about the brand, making products, educating people with recipes, or tabling at community events, Mark and Rochelle are always working hard to curate and innovate an ideal experience for their customer. Definitely can't wait to share this episode with all y'all. There's a lot of perspective about life and what it means to be an entrepreneur. So without any hesitation, Let's get right into it. And action. <laughs> this podcast brought to you by San Miguel Beer, Filipino's finest Literally beer. Literally sponsored. Cheers. This sponsored. podcast brought to you by Purified Water. <laughs> <laughs> sponsored by Cheers. just beers of the world. <laughs> Salud. Mm. Beer does make the world a better place. Not bad. Brought to you by Red Horse. Red Horse Beer. And San Miguel. Wait, what, what was the beer? So we were just on a trip out west to uh, Seattle and Portland. Yeah. And they have their version of, like, Bud Light is yeah. Tecate. Okay. Yeah. Really good beer. It's kind of like a Corona. Oh. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Mexican beer. Yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. Really sure. good. Everyone was, like, raving about the Tecate. <laughs> I've had it before. It is good. I love all kinds of beer, man. Beer's good. What's your favorite beer? Well, my kind of... It's, so, seems kind of dumb, but my kind of everyday go-to beer on a hot day kind of thing is uh, Blue Light, Canadian beer. Love it. But I like every other kind of beer you can think of, depending on the meal, you know, uh, even all the way to Dark Beers, Guinness. And yeah, it's one of those things where you got to be in the mood for it, you know what I mean? That's true. But um, yeah, I'd love to try all new beers. I tried pretzel beer. You know, it tastes like a pretzel. Yeah. I think um, Saranac makes it, I believe. Yeah, I and I had it's s'mores like beer. So you take beer, like my favorite thing, and then you take s'mores, my other favorite thing. You mash them together. <laughs> Did it taste like s'mores? S'mores. It tastes like s'mores. It's awesome. That's so weird. So good. Yeah, I've always been one throughout my whole life, man, to try everything. And I've always tried, like, told my kids and everybody I know, I said, I don't care if you don't like it, if you say you don't like it, after you try it. Don't tell me you don't like it you before know. you try it. Exactly. You got to try it first, and then, then you'll know. Yeah. You know, if you at least try it. So I, 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 I'll eat anything. I'll drink anything. I'll, you know, because I feel like, you know, as corny as it sounds, YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> you only live once. So, I mean, what's the point of, of not embracing everything the world has to offer, man? Other cultures, other languages, sure, yeah. other foods, other drinks. I mean, you'd be foolish. You're only a, given a certain amount, you know, of this gift of life that you're given. You're only given a certain amount of time to live it. Why would you want to, um, you know, deprive yourself of everything that the world, the planet, the civilization has to offer? I mean, try it all, man. That's what I'd say. But, hey, it's a good philosophy uh, to live by. I think so. That was a really Yolo. good. That was a really Yolo. good lead into this episode. Yeah. So we're here <laughs> for episode forty-one with 
I know we said 50, so we, we did episodes before um, Bindalism. Sure. But this is episode 41 of Bindalism with Mark Grove. And uh, we'll give you a little backstory into how we met Mark, and then we'll let Mark uh, kind of introduce himself and let everyone know a little bit about what you do. Um, so Kyle and I were vending at a local event in Syracuse called Crafted. Um, Crafted 2. Craft, it was the second was the second version Held of Crafted 2. Held by Michael John Haggerty. Yes. Shout out. Michael yeah. John has been on the show, um, so we know all about him. Um, and this was basically just a bunch of local vendors um, out behind uh, the most in Syracuse. For anyone who's baby familiar. Wild, wildflowers. And then yeah. they had um, traveling musicians. It yeah, was pretty it cool. Was, there, was, there was a lot going on. Yeah. It was... I mean, I think it was worth going to because we met Mark here. So yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes Great. sometimes it's not as much about making the money as it is about well, networking. the connections, meeting the people. Yeah. That's so, true. That is so true. I've so, always said that. Yeah. So you know, yeah. we got talking with Mark, and uh, you know, obviously you know, the values aligned, and so the planets are. aligned. Yeah. Right. Finally, <laughs> right. it only took like <laughs> yeah, two only months. Took- <laughs> <laughs> We're all busy, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true, man. It's so, tough. Why don't you uh, let the people know who you are, what you do? Yeah, so um, I'm Mark Grove, and uh, together with my wife, Rochelle Grove, we uh, have our own um, gourmet food company um, called Grove Gourmet by Apple Grove Farm. I was originally an apple farmer, and um, over the years, you know, the apple farming, like any farming, is tough, very tough. So um, we started making uh, our own products using the fruits and the products that we grew and and um, started making different types of um, gourmet food products. Um, we started with apple butter and organic apple cider vinegar and things like that and vinaigrettes. And it just kind of grew from there because... How did you learn how to actually make those? Like original I products? have no idea what I'm doing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you just learn from experience. You just... And luckily, I have a... a I love to cook, so it's kind of a passion. And I have a good... Um, um, palate you know so what's your favorite food well everything <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing i won't eat i mean really so yeah, everything i love it i love it everything. With that. <laughs> no one, like yeah. you just eat everything i do yeah i always want to try everything I, I don't know if i really have a favorite i mean i love seafood i love um you know all kinds of i feel like that's what makes someone have a good palate is just having the ability to experiment to with like food. everything yeah yeah and so uh, I'm going to cook for my mom. I have no formal training, but <clears throat> I just, I'm one of those kind of cooks where what have you got in the fridge or the pantry? Maybe Give me 30 more. minutes in a fr- stove and a pan. Shh, I'll cook you something nice. delicious, yeah. you know? And I feel like that's kind of like, um, you know, like an everyday kind of gourmet. Cause I try to make my dishes a little unique, not just so not like hot dogs and beans kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I try to up the game a little bit. <clears throat> but still, I can attest to that. You yeah. just had a dinner with Mark. Yeah, you know, it was yeah. fab. It was amazing. Yeah, it's been <laughs> nice. even vegan. <laughs> yeah, vegan. Yep. Yeah. So nice style. thanks. <clears throat> so what? I tried to apply that to the products that we make, and I I created these products to help people make restaurant style or gourmet style meals at home. So I put all the ingredients they need for the recipe in the bottle. So um, with these two distinct product lines, one is vinaigrettes that can be used as a marinade, and one is the cooking and dipping oils, which you would saute and roast with. Those two product lines, um, the various um, products within those lines, um, I back it up with recipes that I create and put on the website. So it's a way to enable people, you know, because people don't have any, they don't have a lot of time. Everybody's working so much. They don't have maybe all the ingredients that they need. They don't have a recipe, and you know. So I try to simplify it, but at the same time, have it come out like perfect every time. Because the way I created these products, you can't, if you use them in a dish, you, you really can't over season it, under season it. It just comes out like awesome mm-hmm. every time. And so I've kind of been building slowly on that by creating my own recipes using the products, putting them on the website. And then, you know, when we go out to these shows and the festivals, promoting our product i'm able to tell these people hey try this you know try the shrimp scampi recipe that i came up takes 10 minutes you know i said well I'll try this um <clears throat> for example a baked red onion you know something really kind of unique you know like a kind of a healthy version of a blooming onion you know <clears throat> using the two products just follow the recipe or whatever it may be you know and i'm 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what was the first product that you make, that you did <clears throat> so, for this company? Yeah, we've been making these products for a long time, and we started out with maybe more basic products, <clears throat> like vinegars and maybe balsamic vinegars, apple butter, stuff like that. And then as time went on, I've kind of taken it kind of to the next level. Um, so I suppose the first two products that I created were the uh, uh, Italian herb and garlic uh, cooking and dipping oil, mm -hmm. which has over 20 ingredients in our recipe. We also infused the oil in the product. And then the other um, product was our sweet balsamic vinaigrette, which has an aged balsamic, extra virgin olive oil, and all the herbs and spices. And together, you can use these two products to make one meal. Oh, wow. or, well, many meals, but one meal in the sense that you can make the, the main dish and the side dish. So you can make the salad with the vinaigrettes, you could um, saute or roast with the oil. Was that the intention to do it that yeah, way? Yeah, I wanted two opposites that you could also then combine. Because you can use the two together. You can saute and deglaze with a pan or combine the two in lots of different ways. And that way you're selling more than one product. Well, uh, well, ideally, right? If yeah, you know. I just thought it would be boring to just <laughs> sell one product. And it would be fun to sell, not only sell two products to one customer, but two completely different products. Mm -hmm. So I got you to like this, but I also got you to like this. And I... I'm teaching you and helping you now to to use these two things together to you know make better meals at home for your family. It's more so, like an experience that you're creating for people. Yeah, because you have the, the recipes too that you're incorporating, and I you're teaching kind of people. Do. You're an educator. <laughs> I guess. I have, mean, have you had say someone come up to the booth? They buy something. They're they're interested in a recipe. Mm -hmm. Go home, make it, and then yeah. come back to you and oh, tell absolutely. you. Absolutely. And was the, way, the way I structured my recipes, I keep them very kind of free flowing because all the ingredients are in the bottle. It's really, it's kind of like gourmet for dummies. You know, you can't screw it up. And so the recipes, I don't make it like quarter teaspoon of this. No, I'm like, you know, take the product, chop it up, heat up your pan, put in the oil, saute it, you know, take the other product, deglaze the pan, plate it. You know, boil your pasta, shake up the oil, toss it in there like a pesto, uh, take your scallops, you know, sear them in a pan. So <clears throat> I'm trying to make it simple for people, you know, but have it taste gourmet. That was kind of, I guess, what we were trying to do. That's what it's grown into anyway. Yeah. You know, I've yeah, taken my love or my passion for making quick and easy meals for my own family and yeah, and making kind of unique meals, you know. And so <clears throat> by keeping the recipe kind of open, it lets people kind of do their own thing. And so they'll come up to me at the show, they go, I go, well, what do you do with it? And he goes, oh, well, I use it to, you know, roast my potatoes, but I add some Parmesan cheese to it or whatever, or I did this, that, and the other. And we get comments on our page as well. Oh, I love to use it for, you know, this meal or that kind of food. Or mm -hmm. it, So they're able to kind of take it and make it their own. It's kind of what I'm trying to do. What, what's your favorite dish with your, um, well, first off, what's your favorite dressing that you've created? Well, the balsamic vinaigrette is awesome, but we also make another one, uh, which is our organic apple cider maple vinaigrette. Mm, I, yeah, I bought that one. Oh, you did? It's great as a marinade, mm -hmm. but also for salads, especially I like... Uh, I want to see we did like pork chops with that. Yeah, really excellent. Good. It's great with pork because of the apple cider vinegar. Mm -hmm. um, and then salad-wise, great for like a Waldorf salad, which would be like apples and walnuts, feta oh, cheese, yeah. that kind of thing, you know? Um, so... My favorite dish, honestly, I love to just dip the bread <laughs> in both yeah. of them. With this, yeah, I love to snack with a nice glass of wine. That's the beauty of these products. You can use them as an appetizer, or you can use them for the main course. Yeah, there's so many different ways you can use it. That's how we first met you guys. You were just on the sampling. Bread. Yeah, yeah, sampling. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I love seafood, so probably my um, scallops uh, linguine. That's one of the recipes on the website the shrimp alfredo but i also promote a uh, like a sheet pan meal that um people can make so you take a cookie sheet pan and just slice up all your favorite veggies like you know um potatoes tomatoes uh, red bell pepper maybe some red onion um you could add um if you want to keep it vegetarian just stop right there just drizzle the oil some of the balsamic vinaigrette roast it in the oven it's awesome or you could add like boneless skinless chicken thighs to it you know or pork or anything you know and it's all in one dip, one pan, right in the oven. Just roast it. So, yeah, and all the flavors there. You don't have to worry about it being under seasoned or over seasoned or whatever. It makes it easy. 
Would you like to show the, the viewers uh, your product line? Sure. Or just like a couple of pieces? Yeah. yeah. He's got this. So I've got a couple here. This is our garlic cooking dipping oil. And as you can see, there's quite a few ingredients. We don't skimp on the ingredients in there. And um, so this is the one you would use uh, to roast vegetables, or saute, shrimp scampi, toss in the pasta, garlic bread, all kinds of things. And then the other one is our balsamic vinaigrette. Great on salads or as a marinade. The beauty of this is it has tons of flavor. Well, both of them are loaded with flavor. So a little bit goes a long way. Yes. A couple of tablespoons on a salad kind of thing. So you'll get a lot of use out of these. And then a lot of people, what they'll do is, <clears throat> a lot of customers tell me that when they run out of oil, there's still bits and pieces here in the bottom. So they'll add more extra virgin olive oil to it, oh, yeah. um, which I always tell them that will get you by in a pinch, but it's not the same because we actually infuse the flavor right into the oil. Um, they, all these little bits and pieces is just a bonus. Right. So rewinding a little bit, do you want to tell us a little bit of your background, like where you're from, yeah. what led up to where you're at now with the Grove um, my, uh, Yeah, my background, my, I was originally born in England in a pub. My mom and dad, my dad especially, he was just kind of a wild entrepreneur type person. Yeah. And so we lived in Spain and Portugal and eventually came to is that, America. Is that where your, your parents were originally from, was England? Or? Yeah, Okay. My, all my family's from England. I still have an accent if I want to put it on, but you know I've become Americanized now because I am a citizen. But if you know, it's still in me. It's just that you know. Does it come back out if you go? It there? does. It comes back out if my if I'm around my relatives. Yeah, but most of the time I've just been absorbed. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> I've been absorbed by uh, the American culture, you know, because I went to high school here, so yeah. you want to fit in. So even though it might be cool to be the British guy, uh, we moved around a lot when we got to America. And so I was always the new kid. So you tend to get bullied, you know, even though I'm a oh, really? pretty good sized fella, yeah. it's, it, people are still going to bully you, you know. Mm -hmm. So bullying doesn't discriminate. <laughs> it, you, beautiful girls are bullied and, uh, you know, the whole gamut, yeah. the whole spectrum yeah. of people are bullied, you know, one way or another. So um, what was your worst bullying experience? Do you want to? Oh my god! That? <laughs> yeah, he's traumatized. Yeah, I probably am traumatized. I, I don't know. I think I think you know when a new kid in school, I was a big kind of do, doofy kid. Um, they used to call me Baby Huey. <laughs> but uh, there was there was there was some other things that were not quite so fun. I mean, I got chased by you know these kids and. Wait, did you go to Mexico high school? I did not. I did not go to Mexico high school. I graduated in uh, Long Island. Oh, okay. But this, the the most traumatizing thing happened to me in Portugal when I was going to leave. My so-called friends, I guess in the part they were angry that I was leaving or something, and so they kind of was pulled this prank where they kind of fake tried to hang me. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. I remember running home in tears and everything. <laughs> yeah. That's not just bullying. That's like murder. <laughs> Well, hey, you know what they say, well, that would just kill you makes us stronger. So, <laughs> yeah, true. You learn from and then you things. lost anyway, so. Yeah, that was, the, that was I think, the day or, day or two before we were actually leaving to come to America. And, um, Have you ever seen any of those people since? No, never went back. And I was, I want to go back because I loved Portugal. I just, it was my favorite place to live. I just, so many things about it. Matter of fact, you see these lights up here. Um, the reason I have this is because it's a, a memory of my youth because mm -hmm. we used to go to the market at night in the evening um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> in Portugal and they'd have like a farmer's market and they'd be cooking up stuff and all the sights, the smells, the sound of the, the music and um, they would string these lights up and awesome. so that kind of I know, yeah, that, you know. yeah it just it brings back a good memory of living in Portugal I, so, I so, with it. yeah <laughs> yeah but I want to go back, but my father always said, he said, you can't go back because when you go go back, it'll never be the way you're, no, it'll never be the way you remembered it. It won't, it can't live up to this, you yeah, know, this fantasy that you've built up in your head, how great it was. It, it'll just disappoint you every time when you go back. So he says he'll never go back, but I do plan on going back, I think. And my daughters, they want me to take them too. But maybe now I need to rethink that. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah, so then we moved to Long Island and and then eventually 
we moved up here, bought an apple farm as a family. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so oh, that was your dad's idea at the time. Yeah. It's always my dad's idea. <laughs> He's the one that. So, what yeah. makes him jump from business to business all the time? I always called it um, uh, kind of uh, business ADD. Like he would build. He, I think he got more out of the challenge of building the business than he did about actually operating it mm -hmm. and making it profitable. Got it. Okay. So, as soon as he got it to a certain point, he's like, "Oh, what's this over here?" Would he, he sell that there? business and then move? Or? Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. So it was the idea creation behind Yeah, he's, wow. he loved the building of it, not so much the managing of it. And when I got older, he would do the building of it. He'd be the idea man. And then I would be the one to implement his idea. Hmm. And a lot of times his ideas were unrealistic. And hmm. I'm, so I'm running around trying to do almost the impossible, hmm. you know, because um, he had this next great idea, you know. Like when we were doing the food products, we got to a point where the products we made were like four pages. It was ridiculous. There were so right. many things. Each category was six items in each category. And it was, it just got. Out and of that me. was all his ideas? Yeah, he would just keep building on it because I think he'd get bored. He wasn't happy with just, with just having, yeah, this. He's like, oh, let's do this. Well, if we're going to do this, let's do six versions of this. <laughs> you know? And kind of when he retired and moved to the Philippines and everything, I took the opposite um, course. Yeah. I said, instead of trying to please everyone and do the whole gamut of products, which we did everything from oils, vinegars, apple butter, pancake mixes, dip mixes, soup mixes, all kinds of stuff in between, which at the time it worked because we were selling to a lot of farm markets and that whole thing was kind of booming. Mm -hmm. You know, look, like what you see Wegmans, you take for granted, but in the old days, what was like a Wegmans was these local farm markets like Hapner's right, and that kind right. of thing, you know. But Wegmans kind of took that idea and ran with it. So at the time, it was, you know, it, was, it worked. But when I took over, I realized, I said, you know what? I just want to do, I don't mind doing a bunch of different things. That's okay. But I want to focus and have one kind of um, idea, you know, and one kind of, um, like curate and perfect kind of yeah you know? instead of because i realized that you know we make everything ourselves and doing everything yourself you you get lost in all of that and sometimes the quality of the stuff can suffer because you're right. not focusing on one thing and doing it really really well you know okay. so i created these two products and of course that little bit of my father and me, we have five versions of this <laughs> and four versions of this. And then we have other uh, products that we make that are kind of like throwbacks to when we started, like the apple butter, the hot sauces, the marinades and things like that, you know. So it's been kind of a wild ride. But um, I, I feel like I've gotten the company to the point where I'm pretty happy with it. You know, my wife and I, we do everything ourselves set our own schedule and we're able, we've got it to the point now where we're able to do something that we really enjoy and are able to make a living at it, which yeah. is not easy to do. <laughs> so I, I know we, we touched on this before and obviously we, we said we were going to do summary light on here. So I just yeah. wanted to hit on this just for context uh, sure. for the listener. Um, so to get to the point you're at now, you originally had employees working for you. Correct. And so since then, how long has it been since you've been away from employing people? Well, when we had the farm, of course, we had lots of employees because right. we had a store, pick your own, all of that. Yeah. We had um, pickers to pick the fruit. Yeah. But most of it was seasonal help. But when the company was going, rolling right along at its prime, we probably had six or seven employees. Um, but over the years, I just felt like, my life was a little bit out of control and in like my destiny was in other people's hands, whether it was the employees, the customers or the brokers that were selling our products. I felt like I was kind of catering to them and mm -hmm. kind of bending over backwards for them and putting them first and me second, um, which when you have your own business, you have to be willing to sacrifice like that. Right. But I made it a goal <laughs> to say, look, I'm kind of a, I'm very much of an individualist. I, I don't, do well with authority figures. I like to be my own boss and set my own right. course and be master of my own destiny. How you were saying that you've um, owned your own business or you've been working 
in business since yeah, high I've, school. Yeah, I've pretty much been uh, self-employed since high school. I've never really worked for anybody like a nine to five, 40 hour a week job. I've never done it. That's what makes me curious. You, you know, you said you're an individualist. Um, how was it working underneath your dad when you were working for his ideas? <laughs> That's a good how, question. <laughs> how was he in terms of, I guess, being the authoritative figure? Yeah, in that that's a very scenario? good question, actually. Um, of course, he's my father, so you have that love right. of, of your family, of course. But, you know, you also got the alpha male thing, father and son dynamic, you know, which is at times not great. So we would argue a lot, um, especially since he was kind of – the idea of man and some of his ideas were kind of, you know. <laughs> it's like Orange <laughs> County Chopper. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I, yeah, I was the one that had to corral everybody and figure out how to make it work and get it done. And so you're naturally going to butt heads because he's in the office and not really right. knowing or caring what's happening out in the factory. And you're the one that's kind of trying to keep all the plates in the air kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So we did butt heads. So yeah, we did butt heads quite a bit. But we found a way to make it work. Um, but I realized that, uh, you know, when he when he retired and, and moved to the Philippines, I realized that, uh, you know, this is kind of my chance. And I was still struggling with the farm and everything that encompasses. But I realized if if I could sell the farm, if I could kind of do what I want to do, that was my goal. You're, that's your foot in the door. So I set out like a, you know, a five-year plan, 10-year plan or whatever of this goal of selling the farm. And because also the farm is kind of your master as well, you know, because it demands so much mm -hmm. and you're doing, you have to be there when it wants you to be there kind of thing. Otherwise you're not going to get paid. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it kind of is your boss. So I was like, I really don't want, I want to be free from having a boss. I want to be my own boss. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, which is a luxury in this world. There's no doubt about it, you know. But if I could get close to that goal, that's what I was going to try to do. So what I did was I just set this goal that I was going to sell the farm, that I was going to build this place, and then I was going to start taking the business and shaping it into the way I wanted it to be. Because my ultimate goal was to have the business work for me instead of me work for the business. So I just set these goals and it's funny because I would just do a little bit every day to get closer to that goal, even though it was years away. And people would say, oh, I thought you were going to do that or whatever. And it wasn't happening from what they could see. And then eventually one day they go, oh, you did that. Finally. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I thought of it three years ago and I've been working. <laughs> You're just seeing it now <laughs> come to fruition. But uh, all this time I've been building. Towards it's, it's insane. Just <clears throat> like the mental challenge of going through that when you have constant banter around you yeah. noise of people telling you oh you're not there yet wow people don't it seems like human nature but people really secretly i suppose don't want you to succeed then, they don't want you to yeah, yeah there's a little bit of envy there because most people you know they they're your friends and everything but they don't want you to be richer better looking, more successful than they are. They want you to be about the same as them. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're middle class, everything, you know, doing the whole thing, you know. And, and are they actually your friend? It's the question you ask yourself. Well, yeah, and it's very few. It's very hard to find people that really are supporting. I, I've always found myself to be supportive of anyone that I meet. And I never turned down any advice from anyone. Even if they were like... Yeah, I don't care what... Own. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Because I can take that advice and I could throw it away or I could go, huh, I don't agree with this part, but this part's interesting. And I could take that and apply that for my own success. Mm -hmm. So, but if I just was like dismissed you, like, ah, you're a jerk. What the hell do you know? You're old, whatever. You know, you're a woman. What do you know? Things like that. Mm -hmm. You're missing an opportunity to in, not only maybe enrich your life in some ways, but also to help your business be more successful. Yeah. should always be open to what anybody has to say. It doesn't mean you have to do what they say, but you should always listen. That's what growth mindset is. Yeah. So the difference yeah. between fixed mindset and growth mindset is fixed people, they stay stagnant. Yeah. And growth mindset sees that as an opportunity to grow and Absolutely. build, Absolutely. progress. It all ties into my philosophy of don't tell me you're not going to like to eat this until after you eat it.
If you right. eat it and you say you don't like it, yeah. that's fine. Don't be telling me you don't like it before you eat it. Because like that's ridiculous. Yeah. Right? <laughs> How are you going to know if you like it unless you try it? Try to do a book yeah. by its cover. Mm-hmm. You know? Don't knock that's it till so you good. try it. That's that's really right. All the cliches, yeah. but it's, it's totally yeah. true. And in this yeah. scenario, it's more just listen to all ideas yep. and then pick and choose which ones you actually want to Yeah, like, like we touched on earlier. I One of the things I've learned in business is that you know, we as humans, we're always riddled with self-doubt. And there's always the naysayers and people trying to kind of run you down. You can't do it, this, that, and the other. And so you're always kind of doubting yourself. Mm-hmm. And the, I, I look back and the times when I finally listened to my inner voice and then ran with it, that's when I had success in my life. And I, and I know that's true because I can look back in time with re- in retrospect and go, I remember that day. When I decided I was going to do what I, my inner voice was telling me to do, and I did it, and now look where I am at. How did you know that was your inner voice talking? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. I think it's a nagging feeling that you have, and you'll just try this, try that, try the other, but you keep coming back to this one thing, and you're wondering, why am I coming back to this one thing? And the reason you're coming back to that one thing is because your inner voice is telling you it's the right thing to do. It's your... It's your self-doubt, you know, and all the other things in society that are kind of, you know, telling you you can't do it that make you put that making that decision off. So a lot of times I should have listened to my inner voice a lot sooner, but I was scared or I said, well, we'll try this. We'll try that. that And then finally, I'm like, just do what you think you need to do. And I did it. And then I'm like, wow this totally worked. And then I could look back and go, I remember when it wasn't working. And I remember the day I decided to do this, what, what my inner voice was telling me to do. And now look at me now. Mm-hmm. It worked. So yeah. that would be a, a advice I would give to an entrepreneur, should we say. And what was that thing that you like set yourself on that path? Well, it could be knew? anything. It could be a, something as simple as changing the label. Or something as simple as coming up with a different product or something. Or something as simple as, oh, should I do... Um, you know, promote a product in this way or in that way, or it could be any number of things. The point is when you, uh, in just in life in general, or when you own your own business, you're going to come up against these kind of forks in the road, so to speak, you know, mm-hmm. and your inner voice is going to tell you to go one way or the other. And a lot of times you go the other way because you, you're scared, <laughs> you know, and you don't know. And once you start going down that road, you're like, oh, I kind of made a mistake, you know. And then in your mind, you backtrack and say, that day I should have made this decision. And so I'm going to make it now. And then you're finally on the right path. But right. you kind of wasted that time because you hesitated. But you almost can't stop yourself from hesitating. It's like you have – it's the path you have to lead. It's kind of like learning from your own mistakes. You can't yeah. – I can't tell you how to, you know, hey, you know, your life – this and this is, might happen. I'm older than you, so I've learned this and that. And you'll listen to me and you'll say, yeah, okay. But you'll go out and you'll kind of make the mistakes yourself. I mean, that's the frustrating thing about humans or whatever. Not just society. Uh, society in general, we don't learn from the wars of the past. And just like just like people. I mean, think about it. If, if I came to you and said, hey, I'm from the future. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm from the future and I have this book. And it's going to tell you every decision you need to make and what you should and shouldn't do in your life. Like in your teenage years, what you should do here, there, and uh, right? You would go, wow, great. Give me that book, man. I'm totally going to do that. I can see the future, right? But guess what? That book's all around you. It's called your parents, (laughs) your uncle, your older friends. They have the answers to life already, but we're too stupid to listen to it because we have to learn from our own mistakes. We think our best. That's where ego comes in. Ego won't let us accept that. We have to kind of do our own thing because we have to prove that we can do it. Whereas we just kind of stopped and read that book from the future, future, future. (laughs) You know, our lives would be better. (laughs) I wish I could go back 20 years and tell the the old me. (laughs) And probably my father was probably telling me that, you know, but we're. If you could go back in time, what would you tell yourself then? Mm. The biggest advice. Biggest advice. Absolutely no brainer. Biggest advice would be to do what I'm doing right now only 20 years ago. Damn. I should have embraced it much sooner. I and should what's have. the difference? Well, I mean, you know, life is complicated. It doesn't come with a book of instructions. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, 
So I think I spent too much time on the farm. But the problem is you're committed to that and you're kind of attached to it. You're almost chained yeah. to it. it so father. even if... Well, it was your father's. <laughs> yeah, so. right. So you, it was a family business and the farm, it won't let you kind of walk away. I mean, it limits your options. So even though I had these things in my mind and I had these goals, but they were long-term goals. Right. And I would kind of take one step closer each year. Because it was a, you know, a real process for you to get to the point of actually selling the oh, farm yeah. off, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. How long would you say that that process took when you started to say, hey, I actually want to get rid of the wow. farm? It was, well, it, it, in some ways it came kind of fast because it was in me that whole time to break free of it because mm -hmm. it wasn't my true passion, you know? Um, I was doing it out of maybe... Um, you know, the circumstance and I had a family and kids, I had to put food on the table and, you know, maybe um, sort of a respect to my father kind of thing. And it was a lot of those things. You needed the money. Well, of course. Yeah. No. That's the angel story. You got to yeah. live. And so you do what you have to do, even if you don't like it and you don't want to do it, you do it, you know, and you just hope that someday you're able to, to do the thing you want to do, you know, and I was lucky enough to finally get to that mm -hmm. place. But like I said, in hindsight, I wish I had taken that leave 20 years ago, and uh, but there's nothing you can do about it. So the whole yeah. idea of like self-sufficient, um, being self-made, mm. more on that path as opposed to working for someone else, because you still kind of were when you were on the farm. Well, you think I, that's the difference? Yeah, I mean, when I was on the farm, I mean, I pretty much ran the farm myself. My father was in the real estate business, but he was always a presence. And then when we started the food business. Um, you know, he was kind of the impetus to that and I kind of rode along with it, but I, I can take some credit of, because I took his ideas and I made them into something. So it, more practical know, without me, he couldn't have done what we did or we couldn't have done what we did. And without him, we couldn't have done what we did. So we needed each other in that sense. He was the idea man. I was the practical person that make kind of make it happen. Um, so we kind of fed off of each other in that sense. But I, you know, I just am a very independent person and I just want to do my own thing. And it's hard to do that in this world. And you've got to be, it's scary and you got to be strong and kind of believe in your convictions. I feel like I kind of work without a tight, uh, without a net, like on a tightrope without a net a lot of times. But at the same time, that feeling or that ability is so empowering because I know that no matter what happens, I have a skill set, like a natural born skill set that I've honed over the years. It's not yeah. a degree from a college or whatever, right. but it's a skill set that I know that I can apply in various fields to make a good living, to put food on the table and to have a decent life, put a roof over my head. You yeah. know what I mean? Think about how many people just since you've been born until now yeah. have had to go to college, get yeah. a degree and still haven't gotten to a point of being able to do what they are passionate about and make money to sustain their life. Yeah. I mean, most You've people, yeah. well, what happens in life, I think is life just it doesn't come with a book of instructions. Like I said, and life kind of like absorbs you. Like you're so, when you're young, you're getting out of college or whatever, you think the whole world's open and you're going to do this and do that. And you're sucked in. Yeah. You kind of get sucked into that nine to five, right? You're not doing your passion, the thing you want to do. Then you fall in love. Have a couple kids. Next thing you're in the suburbs, white picket fence. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, 20 years goes by, college, you know, paying for college kids. And then you're like, wow, my life, where? Where'd it go? Yeah. Where's all the things I wanted to do? And that's why a lot of people end up getting divorced. Like when the kids mm -hmm. get out of school, like people, a, they go separate ways crisis. because they realize yeah. that the things that brought them together are no longer there. They, they never really fully realized what they wanted to do in life, especially if they get married young. And when they get to that certain age, like, oh, I want to go to do this and I want to do this. And but the two, but you don't want to do it together because you have separate uh, yeah. ideas of what you want to do, you know. Yeah. And so that's why a lot of people end up getting divorced, I think, after the kids are grown. Question How old are you right now? 50 ish. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And would you, do you, based on the fact that you never went down that traditional nine to five route, do you yeah. feel that? based on like comparing yourself to say someone else your age, do you feel mm -hmm. like 
you feel younger than say someone else just because you've been <laughs> following funny. that like path of doing something you really I, want I, to I do. I wonder if it's uh, I think it's just some, something I've been born with because I was always the kind of person that I always liked whatever was new and exciting. I want to live life. I want to take everything in. I'm not trapped in like the 70s, still listening to, you know, the Allman Brothers or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, or the 80s, listen to, um, you know, uh, Motley Crue, which is a fine band, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I always, and I always realized that about myself. A lot of the people in my same age group, they're trapped in that musical decade. Like, you know what I mean? Mm. Where myself, I'm not. I like whatever's current. And I get um, and then I'll get kind of bored of that. I just want whatever's new. So maybe, I don't know if I get that from my father in some ways, but I always uh, want to live life to the fullest. I just want to explore and do. And every day I get up, I want to do something. I, I you know, I can't sit still. Yeah. yeah. I have like a wanderlust, I suppose. But the trappings of life, they tether you, you know, in a sense, so that even though you have this kind of pent up wonderlust to want to do this and go here and do everything, you can't because you there's the everyday things you got to do, you know, you got to pay the electric bill, you got to, you know, you got to put food on the table, you got to do these things that society kind of demands of, of us. But what's the alternative to be homeless? I mean, that's it's true. You know, right? so you have to balance that. And this kind of ties in with bindalism because you have to balance that that need or that want for wanting to travel, explore, and just take in everything the world has to offer. So getting your shit done. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be a homeless guy and do all that stuff. You know, you're worried about where you're going to sleep that night. So you have to balance it between, you know, kind of having – like if, you, if you're a rich guy, you probably have uh, lots of – you have lots of money, but you probably don't have much time. There's a lot of demands on you. You gotta oh, go yeah. here, go there. It's a lot of pressure, this, that, and the other. Rich people problems, you know, yeah. right? They're the yeah. same as us, just more expensive. More money, more problems. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's, that's our, yeah, that was our great Jay Z, <laughs> that, uh, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> the prophet. Um, so, but then at the same time, if you've got lots of time and no money, you're probably living in a trailer and end up doing math or something, right? Because you're going to get into trouble. Right. You're too much it's time that spectrum, right? right? It's yeah. finding that happy So middle. finding that balance where you could say, look, I, I'm i making a decent living, but I have I also need to balance that with having time for me and time for my family, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm not even there yet. I, I fool myself to saying that I am there, but I'm not. You know, it's not the things I like to do. I'd like to travel more. I'd like to get out and just do some exercise and stuff. But every day I get up and there's somehow there's not enough time for it. I'm going to go running today. I'm going to do the. There's no like me time because mm -hmm. I put everything, all of me into the business. I'm just so like focused on that being successful. But at the same time, it's like, when will it be successful enough? That's the scary part to me because I feel like I'm pretty happy with how everything is now, but it's not quite enough. So I need to do more and I need to do more. Mm -hmm. So then the scary part to me is when is it? Do you, you ever reach? That? Yeah, you never will. That's what drives me. That's what drove my father. That's why I had the business ADD. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the scary part to me. And I really battle that with that every day. And I try to force myself to say, no, we need to do more stuff. But I always end up getting kind of dragged back to the other way. The business, you know, if you have a good work ethic and stuff yeah, yeah. and you believe in what you're doing, the business will draw you back in. Yeah. Just like Godfather just pulled me back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Given that you have this scenario where you keep driving yourself towards this ideal, what mm. would you say that ideal is? God, that's a great question. Everybody thinks, oh, I want to be Jeff Bezos or something, <laughs> right? Or I want to be Brad Pitt or, you know, some celebrity or something. I don't know. I, I think... I. And the, this is the, the conundrum of life. Like you want to have enough money so that you can do things that you want to do. But it, the problem is how – see, I'm even having trouble putting into words because, I mean, what is success? Is it fame? Is it money? Is it – That's a good question. My own personal view, success is – Money and time, and almost time a little more than the money, because it's um, freedom. Yeah, and the whole right. pick. And the it's like picture. a race to freedom, yeah. essentially, right? Yeah, I mean, but 
you got to have money to put yourself in those places that you want to be because nothing's free in life, as yeah. we know, you know. But at the same time, I, I don't know. I guess I just, I, I want to be to that place where I don't need to worry about money. But the problem is, if I'm not worrying about money, then I'm probably not going to have any money. <laughs> you see what I mean? You, you got it's it's the it's the lack of money that drives you to want to be successful. Once you reach, I mean, I I firmly believe that you see a lot of people that get handed money in the lottery kind of situation, or they get it um, from their parents or whatever. They end up squandering it because they don't really appreciate it. You know, uh, I think. Didn't have to fight for it. Yeah, I didn't have to fight for it. I, th I feel like you have a more of, um, I don't know, inner kind of maybe pride or whatever if you've kind of, you know, gotten beaten up along the way and you've kind of paid your dues and you've earned it. Like and then you value it more. Yeah, you know what I mean? But I don't know. Honestly, I don't think I'm ever going to be satisfied. And that is, in one sense, a good thing because it's what drives me. But it's a bad thing because it's almost like, like a, like a, I don't know, it's almost like a trap or something. It's like a ball and chain almost. Yeah. Like, but like, not in the worst way, because I feel like a lot of people would rather be <clears throat> in your situation than say working yeah. for some. It's true, but I still, well, a lot of people, they like the structure of just go to work, go home. You don't have to think of anything. Whereas here, we have this door, and when that door closes, works on that side, we're on this side. We live here. And that yeah. makes it hard. I was going to ask. In the middle of the night or something, that. I'll go down to the office and I'll slowly get drawn into there. So it does make it difficult to separate your life and your work, you know, and for my wife as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I it's it's almost like, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to be melodramatic, but like being a tortured man or something. You know what I mean? It's like. You're driven to do this. You got things and, pulling. And, yeah. And you're free because you're not answering to anyone but yourself. But yourself is a hard boss, a hard <laughs> taskmaster. You know what I mean? And no matter how much you try to kind of um, level out, you promise yourself, you know, I'm going to, okay, we're going to take time off. And I always end up going back. Yeah, I do. And I'm, it's daily I'm struggling with it, but I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm trying to take more time. You know, we end up doing these workcations. That's what my wife calls them. <laughs> and we'll go away and we'll do some shows to promote and sell our product. And, you know, during the week we'll have time off. But then I'm like, oh, there's a farmer's market over here. Let's go over there. <laughs> and they're now working three days a week, you know. Yeah. And it's like, why? I, I can't stop myself. Even when you're on vacation, it's still working. Yeah. And that's wrong. How much actually are you working? A week. Well, we pretty much work seven days a week. We really do. I mean, to be honest, it, that's that's the conundrum because I feel like, hey, I'm free. I can take off anytime I want. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> but when you have a strong work ethic, you can right. because you're the boss. Because you're not lazy. And you have to set the example is you. And so you have all these goals and things that need to be done. And so you can fool yourself all the time by saying you can – Oh, I can take off any time. And, and, you know, and we can. Like yesterday afternoon, we were able to get away, go to Walmart and stuff, you know, things like that. But, <laughs> yeah, but it's it, – it, we're constantly working. It's like even if I – like I'll have to go and get uh, supplies. So one day a week or something, I'll have to – I'll set a trip like to Syracuse and I'll make all my stops, all the places, fill up the truck, come on back. Uh, my wife stays here working and she, you know, it's hard on her too. She she gets like ca kind of cabin fever, you know, because we're constantly working. I mean, it's nice because on the weekends we get to take a break and drive places, drive the Andorondacks or drive the Finger Lakes or whatever, which sounds great in theory. But when we get there, we're working <laughs> and we're working these shows, which are like 10 to 6. But you've got an hour or two hours ahead of time, prep time. And then 6, you know, you got a breakdown or it's a two-day show. And then, you know, by the time you get something to eat, go to sleep, we make samples and do all that as well. So we have to do that. And um, some some of the shows are three, four-day shows. And it's physically, it's demanding. It's It's tough. But it's rewarding because we're together. So that's pretty great. Right. You know, you're not completely alone. 
Yeah, me and my wife are together 24-7. A lot of people are like, oh, my God, do you want to kill a person? Why? If you marry someone that you love and you want to be with, and you would want to be with right? them. Well, like yeah, and we're both, <laughs> we're like yin and yang because I have my skill set that I bring to the table and she has her skill set. And they're two different skill sets and they totally work. Okay. Totally work. Yeah. What would you say your skill set is? Mine is probably organizational, but I'm very, uh, I'm sloppy. <laughs> I'm a sloppy organizer, but I get it done. Yeah, but I'm not a meticulous. Yeah, I'm not a meticulous, you know, like you have it on uh, a ledger or yeah, something, right, you know, yeah. I'm like scribbled note here and a post it or whatever. And, you know, I have my own kind of system that's pretty half assed. But at the end of the day, it works. It works. Right? It works. Okay. And then my wife, she's just, um, she's the backbone of the whole company because. She's making all the products and, you know, I'm making all the labels. Uh, I came up with all the products. I do the heat sealing and the, and the capping and the, she does the filling. And then, you know, I organize all the shows, loading the truck, setting up the shows, unloading. We do all that together as well. And uh, so there's two different skill sets. Like many times I call her the production manager, you know, because we wear different hats here. Like if I answer the phone, it could be like put my warehouse hat on and then, oh, this is, yeah, you know. So... She, um, she, um, I call her the production manager and many times I will try to go into her work area to kind of help, you know, and I end up invariably just screwing it all up because she has her own system mm -hmm. and she's like, like a chess, like playing chess. She's like three, she has three moves ahead of me and I come in and I'm like, oh, let me help you do this. And I'm she's just, like, no, <laughs> see the motors, like, get out. You know? So I learned to, um, you know, kind of respect her um, space and let her do what she needs to do. You know, but also trust with that too. Yeah. But I, sometimes I feel guilty because I'll be in the office just typing or doing some research or doing the website or something. And she's actually physically doing things. And so sometimes I feel a little guilty. So I'm like, let me come over to help you, honey. And then pff, I break something or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll go over here. <laughs> right, honey? They're not eavesdropping. Oh, I see. She's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you come down here, honey. Yeah, we need a guest intro. <laughs> yeah, so we haven't cool. had one of those yet. <laughs> Just like a pop-in. No, yeah. I want to include her when we're done, towards the end, if we yeah, for sure. have her pop in as a cameo. Because <laughs> she is shy. <laughs> My wife's from the Philippines, so it's uh, been kind of culture shock for her as well, you know. How long have you two been together? Six years we've been married. Okay. Yeah, but we had a long distance relationship of five years. Yeah. So a little over a decade. Yeah. In, yeah. In well, we really got to know each other really well. That's the great thing about long as you hear about these, you know, 90 day fiancés, whatever, and three months even coming over. And the great thing about us, even though it was hard, right on? Uh, it was hard. <laughs> we did it the hard way. But the great thing about it was after five years of chatting and video chatting and everything, you know that person. And she knew me and I knew her like so well. So it was More almost better. It was, yeah, it was. And it was probably better than dating and stuff like that because I knew she was the right person. So when I went over to my dad's, I was like, I got to pull the trigger. I got to marry this woman because she's she's awesome. We had so many things that we're on the same page about, you know. Which is crazy because you're on yeah, the opposite just, sides of the world. Yeah, opposite sides of the world, different ages, different culture, different language, different everything. And yet we found enough things that we were compatible with to make it work. So, and here we are. I, I wouldn't be here where I am now with what we're doing without her. There's just no way. She just became part of i don't know we just became this kind of force <laughs> this team you know? so is she following along with kind of what you were doing no she's actually so actually, she's actually like, that's a great question because i was still fumbling around trying to figure out what i was <laughs> doing you know and i only came up with these products after um going to the market and stuff with her um and kind of getting some customer feedback that's what made me create these products but we had product line before, but it was a different iteration, you know. <clears throat> but she took this and really kind of ran with it. She ended up coming up with her own um, products, uh, tweaking other products. Um, I used to 
um, buy some of the flavorings and things like that from another com company. Now we make them in house because of her. I was scared. I was like, I don't think we can do that. You know, that's why I buy this for all these hundreds of dollars from these supplier. Like, no, no. It's like, no, yeah. we can do this because in the Philippines, that's the beauty and the great thing about Filipino people. They can, they can find, they can make treasure out of trash. They're hustlers. Yeah. They could just take the things you would throw in the garbage and make like a purse out of it or something or whatever. Cause necessity is the mother of Invention, awesome. You know what I mean? So I have so much respect for Filipino people because they, they're they able to adapt. And they're hardworking mm -hmm. and they're able to adapt to any other culture and like quickly like that, you know. So that's why they're so in demand as workers. I'm, I'm curious just because I think this will kind of help me understand how you two even like got introduced. But like what made your dad go to the Philippines in the first place? Out of all places. Honestly, I that's a good question. Um, he it wasn't his first choice. He, he he was just looking to do something else. That wonderlust that whatever he has that made him go to Spain, you know, made him go to Portugal, made him come to America. Whatever that was made him say, Okay, I want to do something, I want another challenge in my life. So he had gone down to Brazil and he didn't really like it there. It wasn't what he was looking for. He went to, I think, Taiwan, and then he had a friend that lived in the Philippines. It was one of the brothers and the brother of the St. Gregory's. Or I think oh. it was a merchant marine, I'm not sure. But he said, oh, come over and stay with me and you can check it out. And he went over there and he just, he loved it. Just like me when I went over there. I loved the culture, the people. It's so funny because here in America, we, we kind of have built up this wall where we don't trust anybody. Like, we, we're always sizing up people. Like, what do you want? We're always scapegoating. What, yeah, what do you want from me? There's something's not, you know. So we kind of have this little bit of a wall up, you know. Went over to the Philippines, and I still had that wall, that Western wall, or whatever. And these people were being so nice. I'm like, what is their angle, you know? Yeah, what, what are they trying to get out of me? It took like a week. And I'm like, holy crap, man. They're just they don't want anything. Yeah. They're just nice. Get over it. Yeah. It's you are the problem. And once I was able to let that go, I could really, it's its a great feeling to be able to trust people mm -hmm. because here we don't trust. Because the problems with the uh, capitalist society is that everyone's competing. Yeah. You're competing with the neighbors, you're competing in business, you're competing every socially competing, men against women and everything else. So socially, social status, everything's competing here. And that's how the Western world is, you know. And so going there and just, you know, in a nutshell, this is what I would say. In America, in the Western world, we have everything and appreciate nothing. In the Philippines, they have nothing and they appreciate everything. And once I got to that point, you know, I was like, wow, this is great. This is really great. So learning that, yeah. coming back here, yeah. were you like a changed man? I think, you know, well, you know, having grown up in Portugal and Spain and stuff and seen, you know, the... the I, the poorer side of the world, should we say. I already had a feel for it. I already kind of knew it. You know what I mean? And having learned other languages and experiencing other cultures, it was kind of like second nature to just absorb into the Philippines. It was no problem, you know, mm -hmm. other than trying to learn a language, which, by the way, is very difficult because there's two separate languages, the South and the North. The official language in the North is Tagalog. Mm -hmm. the, the language in the South is Visayan. But then there's like a thousand different dialects and like some islands speak different languages. And it's, yeah, like my wife, she speaks Tagalog and Cebu and uh, Visayan. Uh, a lot of people in the North, they don't bother to learn the, the Visayan. They just learn the official language, you know, but the people in the South, they learn the official language plus their own language. You know? So they're more... In the South, the, um, their language is more influenced by the Spanish from the conquistadors and stuff, you know. So, so from the south side. yeah, Mindanao, which the the city that she is from, the mayor of that city is now the president, President oh, Duterte. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Our, our, our good friend growing up, uh, his mom is actually from the Philippines. Oh, okay. I think she's from the north. Yeah. Area. Shout out to Drew Torres. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we got to do a shout out Christina. to another damn sports podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he always shouts us out on his podcast. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Cool. He, he runs a sports podcast <laughs> out in Buffalo. Sweet. Um, but yeah. And 
his mom will always have all of her friends who also were all from the Philippines. They all moved over. Oh, yeah. I think around the same time. Once you meet one Filipino, you meet like all of them. Yeah. Literally. You know, literally <laughs> the funniest story yeah. where I'm, so I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing a physical therapy right now for my knee mm-hmm. um, because of the knee injury I just had uh, back in February. And one of the receptionists at, SOS mm-hmm. is one of Andrew's mom's friends yeah. who's from the they, Philippines. And, and I was like, oh my. She's like, she's like, do you happen to know Andrew Torres? And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing you know, they'll be cooking you food and bringing it over like, your house. Do you make sure. egg rolls? Are they good? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Growing up, it's literally like at his house, all the Filipino adults are upstairs and then all of the children are like yeah. down in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> so like maybe they're Phil Ham or whatever. So yeah. they have part of the culture, but they kind of been absorbed like I have been by mm-hmm. the american culture and so yeah, yeah they, they're almost like their yeah. own little subculture you yeah, know what i mean really yeah it's true so yeah so mm-hmm. we're we're semi-cultured by it <laughs> man this podcast has gone all over the map i mean yeah. all over the this globe is, this is like yeah. Yeah. this is worldwide <laughs> so two uh two podcasts ago we interviewed um a couple that are travel photographers slash videographer oh, cool. and so right now i think they were just in hong kong wow they're, i think cool. they're in taiwan right now but so that was really cool to talk to yeah, people yeah. who've just seen like so many. Well, it's funny, you know, that's one of the things. If I could redo my life, I would have probably tried to follow my. I, I have a creative side, and so I should have pursued that creative artistic side and maybe become a writer. I, I I'm pretty good at writing in my head. Maybe not so much writing <laughs> <it> down, <laughs> but or maybe a photographer or something like that where I could travel because that's mm-hmm. my love. Like, of course, Anthony Bourdain, God bless his rest his soul. Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't want that dream job? You know what I mean? To be able to travel all right. over the world and taste yeah. all kinds yeah. of food and all the culture and uh, that's a dream job. A nice. dream job, absolutely. You're a cook. Yeah. True. You know? So if I knew Make then, that. if I knew then what I know now, I think my life would have taken a different path. But you don't get to choose how your life goes. You really don't. You're a young 50 years old, though. Yeah. So yeah. you still have at least another 50 years or more. Oh, wow. Octogenarian, spanning the globe. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Tahiti, you know. <laughs> I have my own blog and everything. Yeah. You never know, right? Well, it's amazing, man. I mean, technology and things. Look how things have changed so much just in 20 years, you know? I mean, just think there's people alive, you know, our grandparents and great-grandparents that, you know, had the old rotary. Do you even know how to use a rotary phone? Oh, you do. I used it. So in my house. (laughs) Did you learn on YouTube? (laughs) So my dad, my dad being the the electronics whiz he is, uh, he had old rotary phones from his house oh, growing okay. up and he yep. plugged them, he hooked them up in our house so that yeah, we're in our room, he could call us to dinner yeah, or whatever, so cool. or we could call to like- See, your dad is wicked so. cool, man. <laughs> he just like hooks up all these gadgets. So that, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But it's amazing. To, yeah, it's I, I mean, we think we're so, you know, high tech and so kind of modern and we have all the latest things, gadgets and wait fifty years. Yeah. Fifty years would be insane. I mean twenty years is gonna be insane. You know what I mean? It's it's moving so quick. You know? It's moving faster. Oh, yeah. It's exponential growth. Yeah. yeah. It's Moore's Law. Just, yeah. It's exploding. Are you familiar with uh, Moore's Law? No, it's explain. just uh technology's on this exponential curve. Mm. And so basically um as it gets further along it doubles and then it doubles, doubles double, that, double, doubles, yeah. double, doubles that. And, and now that. <laughs> so uh, bottom line, we're living in a matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is actually a video game that someone in the future is playing with us. Yeah. I'm taking the red pill. Yeah. <laughs> I was just, it was funny because a thought came That's through crazy. my head just talking about this um, was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Rick and Morty. Yeah, sure. It, it was an episode where I think Morty comes back to, and he was like, in a simulation and, yeah, they, yeah. and Rick's like, you know, you spent way too much time on this whole like venture here. You really wasted like a good 30 yeah, years yeah. on just bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, that could literally, we could yeah. die and wake up and be like, oh, we're on life two now. Who knows? Like, we, who knows what life this is? You will never solve this mystery here at this table. What do you no. think? It's not gonna happen. What do you think, man? <laughs> After life here. It's so mind boggling. It's all just it's, speculation. It's just, yeah, it's just so mind-boggling. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I, I don't know. See, that's the thing. Know. Like, that's yeah. that's what's cool about this podcast is, like I was saying, our last podcast we talked to someone who's a devout Christian, mm. and so 
he has a very clear cut, oh, okay. clear cut, right? All that that's that's yeah. his explanation, Afterlife. right, and sure. his truth. And then you have someone else who believes maybe a different religion or no religion, right? And it just changed all these different perspectives. Well, of what it could be. I feel like you know, we are such a tiny, insignificant, you know, thing in the universe. It's like a dot. The, the, yeah, blue, the like blue dot. dot right? really yeah. 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 So what makes us so bold or so egotistical to think that you know our story of creation or, our, the most. or any of our yeah. religions are the answer for the universe? That's pretty bold statement don't you think we have no idea what's out there or what's come before us and yet we stick to these this dogma like mm. it's you know 100 percent the truth yeah we got to remember that when we're stressed out yeah that we're just a speck of dust yeah and everything will be okay that would be so <laughs> nice if you just click a button and it blasts you out like to like jupiter real quick and you're like yeah. oh i get it back <laughs> all right well i guess it would be nice to that's that's the you know, the kind of quandary is like, do you want to live in a world where you don't have, there's no challenges. You don't have to kind of do anything. You just no kind of exist. Yeah. And everything is just laid out for you. You just kind of exist. Or do you want to do it kind of the hard way, like humans they are doing it, you know, we're making mistakes left and right. You know, I mean, the only thing that gives me hope about the future is no matter how much we destroy the planet, we'll always find a way to fix it. Technology, the free market. We'll find a way to fix the problems. Until we don't. (laughs) Yeah. It's like the ozone layer, you know, (laughs) that used to be the big thing, you know, and then they stopped. I I just think with like technology itself, even if Earth gets to a point of being not inhabitable to the point where we can like be outside and stuff, I just think technology will allow us to move indoors. Terraform it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mars, like a Star Trek episode. (laughs) Yeah. Or not. I mean, I think um, that's like the next move. If the that's question how it is, is, can we do it in a quick enough? Because it does get to a tipping point where you can't bring back some things. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like the coral reef. Well, it's getting yeah. obliterated. That's a nightmare. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Like the Philippines, it's, it's a big thing over there. And because the Philippines, you got 7,000 islands. And so, you know, you got people just living day to day. They have to make enough food and rice and food and whatever for that day. And that's all they think about is that day. They mm-hmm. don't think about tomorrow or long term so much. So a lot of the fishermen were dynamite fishing, cyanide fishing, can you oh, believe shit. it, over the, you know, back in the day. Yeah. And it's destroyed the coral a lot. But now they have these conservancies where they uh, won't allow any of the fishing, have outlawed any of that kind of fishing anymore. But it's easy for us to go, Oh, what are they stupid? They're destroying the planet and stuff. And it's easy for us to say that, but they're also starving. <laughs> you know what I mean? They need to eat. Yeah. But what, you know, it's frustrating because you'd like to say, look, if you just kind of get some of these fish and kind of farm them and raise them, you could like have fish forever. You know what I mean? Don't just, yeah. <laughs> don't just fish for today. Like, you know, fish have fish the farms. And, that's the, the capitalistic mindset that's popping in. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. That's one of the good things about capitalism yeah. because right. it makes it, it, it drives innovation and, and competition is what drives it. That's what's crazy. <clears throat> I'm maybe there is a place that's like this, but it seems like I feel like no matter what there is in the world, there's always this this very extreme right or left yeah. or west or the, east, but there's always this it's always actually on the spectrum and there's gotta it's be it's some middle, happy it's where it really works. But you need the two extremes for the middle to work, right? Because the, these two extremes make the make them want to come together they're to work it out because it's so magnets. far out. Yeah, they're yeah, two yeah. magnets, and the middle is when they're actually. And yeah. That's the beauty about America. Yeah. It's because it allows that ex- two extremes to coexist. Yeah, and not kill each other. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's compromise in the middle, you know, and there's a lot of talk of socialism and all this stuff now and everything, but. Trust me, I mean, as as flawed as our system is, you don't want to live in a world where the government kind of owns everything yeah. and tells you what to do and you can only reach a certain level because nothing will ever – that's why the Soviet Union collapsed because you got a guy that works in a factory and uh, is kind of lazy and doesn't care. You got another guy who's working super hard. And they're making the same. Same, and he'll never go ahead. So then the next thing you know, you're hitting the vodka and he's hitting the vodka and then – Nothing gets done. And that's why if you go to Russia, it's like going back in time, you know. Or if you go to Cuba, same thing, because there's no innovation. There's no competition. There's no striving for more. You know what I mean? And that human need to build and to create things and greed, 
also of capitalism. But capitalism has to be kept in check too, because right. otherwise there's that, there's, capitalism run rampant gets us into the problems we are now yeah. with garbage in the ocean and all the other things. You know, I almost yeah. think it's human nature to have a little bit of that competition in us, because like you look at animals trying to survive. Jungle, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, yeah, we were just talking about all the negatives to capitalism, but maybe it's not all that Well, it's bad. interesting because, like, yeah. capitalism is one of the few systems where you – maybe everyone doesn't have equal opportunity to get things done if you were born into a shitty scenario or mm -hmm. whatever, but – your odds in this system yeah. are much better than, say, okay. being there's born into the Soviet Union. Union. There's many success stories of people having nothing yeah. and becoming Jeff Bezos. You know, working out of your garage, making Microsoft, things like that. Yeah. So this, what you're saying is there's a greater chance of that happening here, here than, than there is else. any other system. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, you know, America... The Founding Fathers were so smart because at the time when they came up with this kind of radical idea of the people being in charge of the country, um, you'd had centuries of kings, dictators, churches running the ruling the people. And so what America was exper – this experiment was kind of like crazy. <laughs> the rest of the world was like, what are you, nuts? Let the people run the show. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? And we maybe lost sight of that a little bit. And, you know, the politicians nowadays – they don't realize that they work Something for us. Needs to bring you know us what I mean? <laughs> yeah, sure. a little bit. So, um, as flawed as the system's been, which there's definitely some low points in American history for sure. But when you look at it in the big picture, the whole picture, show me another country that's done a better job. In any amount point. of time. Yeah, yeah right? any amount of time. What, like 250 years, years? Something like that. Some chunk change, right? You, you can't deny that. And it's because of our capitalism that's driving our innovation and in technology, mm. which is going to have a positive yeah. impact for the world at large, potentially. Sure. Well, this is With, one of the if things. we have like free Wi-Fi all over, then yeah, that people in Africa, yeah, Tide versus all boats, right? Um, it's like this whole thing with the Medicare for all, or you know, health. Of course, we want everybody wants to have reasonable or free med medical care, you know. But the problem is that if you demonetize, if you take out the incentive, you know, come, um, drug companies are not kind of going to come up with the latest, greatest things. Guys are not going to, people are not going to, women and men are not going to go to school for 12 years of their life to be specialized in something. These, because it's no, they're not going to get a reward of it. They're not going to get, I mean, there's rewards in many ways in life, obviously, um, the reward of helping people and stuff like that. But what drives people is, you still want to have the comforts of life, right? You, so mm -hmm. that pushes, and, and the same with drug companies and medical um, innovations and stuff. What drives that is profit. Those companies have shareholders. They right. want to be paid. That drives the world, right? So if you take that out and you say, well, we're going to reduce it down to just kind of the lowest common denominator, that's one of the flaws of the system because now you're taking out the incentive for all the breakthrough right. technologies. And that's, and that's why I like what you said. It's more about just getting to a point of regulation where it's still competitive, right? Yeah. People are still making the money, yeah. but they're not doing it at the cost of human life. That's, That's where the government's role is to step in. But right. that balance between them stepping like, in and going too far yeah, and not doing enough. It's black and white right now yeah. where it's like, it's either this extreme or this extreme. And we got to find that, that yeah. moderate middle. It's hard it, to find though. It, it's, it, yeah, things are pretty divided right now. Do you think there's a cure to cancer? And they just don't want to tell us? Uh, now we're getting into conspiracy theories, <laughs> I guess. Honestly, I don't know because, um, you know, that is a big money generator. <laughs> the search for this holy grail cure, you know, do they really want to find it? I don't know. I don't think we can answer that one on this podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm sure there's a lot of that going on, right? Something that may have been found. But well, you know, there's always in every anything, you know, supposedly there was an engine that ran on water back in the day. And, and the nope. big companies, they yeah crushed it and hid the technology, you know. But who knows? Like we didn't go to the moon. We didn't step on the moon. And stuff, yeah, you know. flat or, earth. All that right? stuff. That's flat <laughs> earth, exactly. Shout out to the flat earthers. I was wondering about the flat earth. What happens when you get to the end? You just fall off? No, so cra was, crazy. Uh, so there's a um, YouTube channel called Vsauce, and he mm -hmm. did he did the explanation of what Earth would be like if it was flat. Okay. And so because of gravity, mm -hmm. Earth would actually be a bowl. Okay. So 
as you get cl- as you get closer and closer to the edge, it actually becomes more and more Whoa. like this, like okay. straight up and sure. down. And then as you get to the middle, so okay. he literally showed like what it would be like to like walk down a street. It's like all of a sudden it gets steeper and steeper, and the gravity gets harder and harder. So you like your body physically couldn't actually. And what you what wouldn't was, be able to go. What to was he smoking exactly? <laughs> he was just doing it based oh. on just like science and stuff, like. Like, if you're basing right. it on the laws of physics, it's just, like, impossible. All I don't... <laughs> I, I feel like I can disprove flat earth theory in one simple thing. If I stop walking from here straight and just keep walking, sailing... You're never going to fall off the earth. No, I'm going to end up where I started. <laughs> yeah. How is that with possible the compass, if, right, it's, with the compass? if I stuck to a trajectory, planes, trains, um, automobiles, sailboats, whatever it takes, Right. I'm going to end up right where I started. So how can I do that if it's flat? I couldn't walk straight no. and end up here. What are you going to go on the, the bottom side, the, the back side? Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 I just disproved the whole thing right there on this podcast. <laughs> earth shattering news. Why, why should this be like earth. the one episode where we get like a it's bunch over. of comments? Yeah. like, you guys just started yeah. trashing flat earth. <laughs> Don't trash flat earth. <laughs> yeah. We have rights too. But I mean, that, that just blows a hold of the theory right there. Yeah. Right? We have the technology through GPS to go f- straight in a straight line yeah. over mountains, water, I rivers, valleys, whatever. That. We have the technology through GPS to do that. So if we stick on a straight line, eventually, however long months it takes, we'll end up right where we started. How can you do that if the Earth is? I would love flat. to hear uh, uh, a rebuttal. I would love to hear uh, some yeah, rebuttal here. that because. <laughs> I feel like I'll be laughing before they actually finish their rebuttal and be like, dude, just stop. But, you know, a lot of things we've been talking about ties into with your philosophy of this bindalism, you know, to kind of be your own master, um, kind of be one with the world, do your own thing, um, but try to do it in a way where you, you know, leave a small a footprint as possible, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. You know, that's how I am in my yeah. business. Mm-hmm. I there's certain way, you know, I, I try to act professionally and there's certain things I would do and won't do. I don't want to lie to people. I don't want to try to sell them something that I don't believe in. You know, that's not what I'm about. I'm not a car salesman, <laughs> you know, so uh, that philosophy, I really believe in that. So I think it ties in with a lot of what you're saying about, yeah. you know, adventure, take YOLO, you know, mm-hmm. try everything, go everywhere. I mean, that's what... The quote unquote hobos, that was their whole philosophy, man. Yeah. Jump on that train and just go. When you get to the next mm-hmm. town, get off, check it out, and jump on the train again. <laughs> right? Yeah. I really I really feel like this iteration of our podcast has really helped us hone in on that message. Because mm-hmm. so I think that's really the root of what started this in the first place. But I don't think it was realized until we started interviewing mm-hmm. others. And we started to see the connections yeah. and the themes. And we're like... And so your company has grown by your own experience. Yeah, Much, definitely. I mean, we're mirroring our experiences. You know, mm-hmm. my experiences in life and challenges made me, led me down a path, say, that I applied those things to my business mm-hmm. to create kind of my own future, mm-hmm. you know, the way I wanted to live my life. And mm-hmm. so you guys, kind of same thing. You kind of had this idea, but you weren't really sure, it wasn't focused. And then once you started kind of, hearing what other people had to say and applying it to your philosophy, you started to really be able to kind of fine tune it. Right. I would say that we found ourselves through other people's experiences, through our own experiences. And just by hearing other people's perspectives, that kind of like honed in on the philosophy itself. And the crazy part is, is that like when we interview people, Mm -hmm. we don't ask them a bunch of questions like, who are you? What are you about? Just a free flow. Yeah. But we somehow find this common thread between all of us. And And like, for example, I would say more than 90% of the people we've interviewed haven't been a scenario where we met them prior. It was like we've never talked to them other than like through the internet. Yeah, yeah. And then we meet them and it by the end it feels like Doesn't we're their you, closest friend. Doesn't that give you so much hope though for society? Because yeah. I feel like, you know, when things are seen like a mob, mob rule kind of thing, bullying or whatever it is, po- political stuff or whatever, there's so much kind of hatred. Uh, between the races or between anyone, mm-hmm. right? But 
when you take those people and put them just one on one, there's no problem whatsoever. I mean, whatsoever. They just get along. They, but when you get in this mob mentality, maybe we have one person has hatred and it kind of becomes this kind of, it metastasizes like yeah. this kind of disease or something. And then you've got the kind of division and the hatred that we're seeing right now. But one on one, we could disagree, but still get along. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. when you get the mob, the Twitter trolls and everything yeah. that the hate comes out. Don't and it seems like up. that's it seems like that's the rule. But really, this is the rule. And that's the exception. But yeah. you just don't see it because all you really see is the constant flow from the media, the big picture. You don't realize that the one on one is really the real truth. It's, it's yeah. interesting, too, because I don't even think that that's what we could be providing with this, because really for us, we were kind of we're more in the interest of, like I was saying, exploring the human experience and sure. understanding all perspectives. Mm -hmm. But really, you're right. We, we could potentially be bringing hope to people. We're just listening and being like, wow, yeah. like, what so, a genuine conversation. You don't even realize that you're actually saving the planet. Even if it's one one life at a time, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Ties into perfectly into the next question. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have this one life to live. How do you want to impact the world? You know, that's such a great question because I feel like, you know, if I can just get my shit together, <laughs> if I can just get to where I want to be and I'm perfect, I have, I want to help so many people. I want to do stuff, you know, to help other people. But I'm also fooling myself because I'm never going to get to that point. So we, I try to do what I can. We help her family. We send packages over to um, my father's and to the people there and to my um, wife's family and stuff. I don't do a lot in the community and stuff just because I'm so devoted to what I do, my work, you know. Uh, I guess you could say I am a prophet trying to help people cook better gourmet restaurant style meals at home, <laughs> which enriches their life in some way. But I feel like I do want to get to that point where I can, um, you know, help people, especially living in third world countries and stuff and seeing how little so many other people have. Like in America, we we have this perception of the world that, you know, they think we think the rest of the world thinks like us and is like us, but they're not. I mean, probably 70% of the world is nothing like this. And the problem with Americans is not, on, not only do we think that way, but then when we travel, we go to these kind of like all-inclusive resorts with a casino. We don't and yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not even going out into the culture. Or even, they're like, yeah. it's dangerous. We're drinking our Bud Light <laughs> from a can or whatever. We're not trying the local foods. We have, we want a burger, and we want, you know, we want McDonald's when we're in, you know, some in South America or something. Instead of really going out, venturing out, and and um, yeah, because we're afraid, I suppose, and ignorant, you know. So um, I. I don't know. I feel like I I guess I could follow my father's example because at the time when he moved to the Philippines, I said, Dad, why are you going to the Philippines? Right. And he Valid said, question. he said, look, I'm getting old. He says I could stay here and end up in a nursing home and have somebody who doesn't really care about me, you know, and just die, waste away. He said, or I could come here and I could help these people have a better life. And in turn, they're going to take care of me so that I have a better life. So it's a little bit self-serving, but it's also... Um, it's a mutual benefit. Yeah, it's kind of mutually yeah. beneficial. And when he said that, I was like, oh, Makes sense. I get it. And they've saved his life because he had health issues and things. And, wow. and he's become, it's become like a family there. You know, he helps them. They help him. It kind of, it kind of works, you know. So, yeah. That's awesome. Crazy journey of life. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are just starting. I'm about halfway through. <laughs> we got to get Rochelle in here, though. Rochelle, come here. I'm not going to do this without you, my partner. In crime. My partner in crime. Come on down. Bring the dog, too. Yeah, the dog. She's the third member of our team. Wait, what's your dog's name again? Her name is Toy Toy. And it means puppy in Filipino. Aww. Yeah, toy toy. And there she is, the one and only <laughs> Rochelle, <laughs> Rochelle Joy Grove. <laughs> Smile at the camera. <laughs> in there. Um, so we uh, typically end our podcast with a... Uh, Kisses and hugs? Uh -huh. 
<laughs> a question oh, okay. that's uh, more beer. <laughs> it's oh, no it's more probably beer. the most introspective and deep question that you'll get on this podcast. Okay. Um, so take your time if you need it. All right. Um, hold me. <laughs> <laughs> Given your experiences and everything you've done in your life, mm -hmm. what does it mean to mm -hmm. you to be human? Oh my god, that's a hard question. I. I suppose, you know, I got to go back to my kind of work ethic, you know. I just feel like I need to create stuff. I need to do, <laughs> you know. And some of it is, most of it is self-serving because <laughs> I want a better life for myself, my family, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, in what I do, I feel, really feel like I'm helping people in a way. It may be a kind of a dumb way. It's not Mother Teresa or anything <laughs> like that, you know. But in a small way, I feel like I'm, you know, kind of doing my part to help people, help families in a little small way, you know, to mm. just, right? I mean, to have better meals and to make yeah. it easier for them because that's always a challenge for people. Um, to be human, I mean, wow, that's a huge question, you know. Well, the, I, by you doing this, this work that you're doing, you're creating yeah. value in yourself. So you have something to give to okay. others. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's funny because when we go on the road and we go to these shows and everything, I almost feel like um, kind of a not a profit, but like a not not a profit or a snake oil salesman, but someone right in the middle, <laughs> you know, where I'm I'm enlightening somebody. I mean, so many times people are like, oh, my God. Oh, wow. That's great. I never thought of that. And so I feel in that small way, I've kind of. Um, you know, maybe educated them a little bit or kind of given a little something to the life that they didn't know before they walked up to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So. But and if they keep coming back, then you know that you left an impression, a good impression. Well, I think we do yeah. because we get a lot of feedback, you know, from people and people keep coming back for more and, and, um, and some, uh, customers, they try the recipes online that since they bought the stuff. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. like it, right? Yeah. So. That's why they're coming back. So I don't know. I I guess in a nutshell, I'm just trying to do the right thing, man. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to do the right thing by my, for myself and for everyone I, I come in touch with, I guess. I just, I want to do no harm, you know, mm -hmm. and I just want to try to do the right thing as much as I can. I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, I don't think there's any right answer here, right? Yeah, I, I, I think it's... Yeah. Well, um, it's a deep question for sure. You know? This is your uh, your moment to tell the people how they can find you, where they can find your products, all that good stuff. Oh, okay. So it's pretty simple. We're applegrovefarm.com, uh, Grove Gourmet, and you can find us um, on Facebook, Instagram, and all that. We're not on Twitter, though. We don't do the Twittery thing yet. But we're working on it. <laughs> There's only so much we can do. Twitter's kind of a funky place yeah. for a business. Sure, yeah. I would see that. I feel like Instagram, especially if you're selling Instagram. something like this, Instagram's yeah. a great place. Yeah, we do that. Yeah. But we're trying. Uh, you know, we do everything right from an empty bottle all the way to a finished product. And then all the recipes that go with it and all the marketing, all the packaging, mm -hmm. All the traveling and the shows and everything is done by these two people right here. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it gets overwhelming. So when you're doing all that, you know, there's definitely going to be things that fall between the cracks, you know. But I'm always great at answering an email. So applegrowfarm at gmail.com. I always answer my emails. We do have an 800 number. We do have a phone number as well, local phone number um, with a voicemail. I'm not so good at returning those calls. <laughs> I even put on the voice voicemail for for immediate assistance email us at applegrowfarm at gmail.com. Uh, just because we're in and out and, you know, I see the light flashing on the uh, machine. I don't, I write it down. I don't always get to it. And I, you know, I know sometimes people get mad about that, but I'm wearing like five different hats here. So I don't have, you know, someone that's just answering phones or taking care of that. So it's, it makes, you know, I, I try to make it up to any customers that might feel slighted in any way. Um, but, yeah, applegrowfarm.com is all you need to know. Everything's on there, the recipes, the products. And then if you like us, follow us on Facebook. Um, I always post where we're going to be because we do shows. Yeah, is there any uh, upcoming events that you'll be at? In a yeah, we will be in the lovely village of Sequoit, New York, okay, this weekend. 
Yeah. No, it's not, not no, it's south of Utica. Oh, really? I yeah. thought it was Rochester. Oh, too. Was wrong. Like this is a new show for us. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> this is a new show for us, so we don't know what to expect. But we hope you know we learn something new at every show, regardless. No matter what show we've done, we've done everything from you know car shows to outdoor expos and everything in between, craft shows and wine festivals and everything. And we have fun and get to meet the people and learn a lot along the way. And it's great for our business because when we get to meet the customer, we instantly hear that customer feedback. Like, oh, why do you have this? Why? It's one of the reasons why we color coded our products because we used to have all the oils in one, this that same. Yep. Product. And so now that's one of the improvements that we've made. And that was from customer feedback. Other people were like, oh, I like lemon. Do you have any lemon? So we came out with two lemon based products. And we never would have done that, or maybe eventually we would have come up with it, but we probably never would have done that if we hadn't been on the show and heard that customer feedback. So that's the, the really the biggest benefit of doing the shows and meeting the people one on one, and they give me ideas too. They go, oh, "I used it to, uh, you know, roast this or that," and I'm like, "Oh, I write it down on the show when I get home." Yeah, and then, and then I throw it up on the website, you know. So you can always learn stuff, man. That's the one thing I've learned about. In life, so to speak, right. so much to learn. And there's just so little time, you know. <laughs> it really is. On the speck of dust. Oh my god! On the speck <laughs> of dust. There's so little time. Yeah. You got to grab every day mm -hmm. and and squeeze as much as you can out of it. And you can't. And a lot of times it's it's boring. It's everyday type of stuff. But you gotta just have that kind of drive and be open and have that positive attitude every day. And it is hard to do that yeah, sure. but you're going to get the most out of life if you have that kind of attitude don't think like a drone or whatever think like a master of the universe like he even managed, he managed Shira. <laughs> yeah <laughs> even if it's only your little yeah. universe exactly yeah awesome well, well mark thank you so much yeah. thank you for coming on a mission <laughs> I guess the mission is not is only halfway. <laughs> I'm boldly going. Yeah. The story is yet to be Yeah, told. We'll right. see you in fifty years. Hi, <laughs> how are ya? <laughs> Come back in fifty. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be good. Uh update. <laughs> this just in. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Who knows where where the road's gonna lead? I'm just happy to be on it, man. I couldn't agree more. Just happy to be on it. Be able to do it. You know? Grateful you've been on vandalism. Yes, Bindalism. So there you have it. Thanks again for tuning in to Bindalism, a philosophy to self-sufficient lifestyle. Be sure to explore other episodes of Bindalism on our Spotify and Apple podcast. You can find more Boho Hobo stuff on Instagram and Twitter at Boho underscore Hobo underscore, as well as on our Facebook page at Boho Hobo Lifestyle. It'd also be dope if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Our YouTube channel has more episodes from Bindalism in video form, along with other random shenanigans that we're up to. We're constantly filming new experiences, so it's one way you guys can stay up to date with us in our journey. So yeah, I guess that's it for now. Until next time, peace.